Yeah, so if ever I were to take part in a movie, I'd like to be a secret agent. And I'd love to have the name Buford Buchanan Richford Moss. Okay, well, <laughs> be that as it may. <laughs> Code name. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah. Now you know, if you want anything done, if you want it done well, if you want it done properly, <laughs> don't come to me. <laughs> Right. <laughs> We're in week three, as uh, Miller already mentioned. <laughs> and we've discovered over the past few weeks that we actually have arrived on, into this planet and into this life in the middle of a process that started long before we got here. And we became participators in what God's plan is for life on earth. When we accepted Christ, when we stepped into the new life that he has offered us, um, and each one of us, as we heard last week, as individuals have become new creatures in Christ, participating in the mission that he has for us as individuals, as human beings. And today, as we go into host protocol, um, we're talking about how we together form something of a powerful, um, not just image, but a powerful energy in the earth to promote and to forward God's plan and purposes for the nations. But uh, just today, it's one of a couple of conversations, so don't, uh, don't think we've said everything we needed to say. You're probably wondering why we're tapping into this Hollywood Mission Impossible thing. It's just that we love Tom Cruise. No, 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 no. <laughs> That's not where this is going. Okay. I don't know if you've noticed it, but so many Hollywood franchises are picking up on specific themes that have always been prevalent in society, and they're putting their own spin on it. Sometimes they bend it, like Beckham, but sometimes they get it right, and sometimes they get it so, so, so wrong. But of course, where do you think Hollywood got the idea of a king and his kingdom, and people who are fighting for justice, for righteousness, People who are standing up against bullies who are taking advantage of people who can't protect themselves. Where did all this come from? Where did they get those ideas? I think they come straight from Scripture. They see things or they are aware of things that God is busy doing. They tap into something of that and then they put their own spin on it. Yeah. I think some of the vocabulary literally comes from the throne room. I can imagine on the day of Pentecost, while the Holy Spirit was having a field day, just lighting up everybody's lives and filling them with his presence, how the Father just nudges the Son and says, welcome back, <laughs> good to have you here. <laughs> and looking at what's happening, saying, oh, don't you just love it when a plan comes together? <laughs> And Jesus saying, yes, I do. <laughs> so glad to be part of your purposes and your plans. I think in Ghost Protocol, the uh, Mission Impossible movie, we've got something of an iconic moment, Mission Impossible. You realize that in uh, previous centuries, the church used to be the tallest building in town. Uh, now we have a hotel, uh, office block, which is the tallest building in town. And uh, I suppose it's, for some people, it's like a metaphor for the church. It's out there. It's up there. It's something that, you know, if you really want to get into it, man, it is so difficult. Uh, you need to get up to some other space in this church where a lot of stuff is happening so that you can tap into the power to be able to save the world. And, yeah, you're on the outside struggling to get in. Uh, yeah. It seems like you need Spider-Man gloves or something uh, to get a grip on this thing that we call church, you know, just so that you can stick this slippery, slimy, uh, dangerous precipice that we find ourselves in as we engage with church, should I, shouldn't I? Do I take the step? Do I start the climb? Do I get into this? Do I not? It's, is my life safe in this space? Shall I do this? Shall I climb up into what God's plan is for my life? Is it really so difficult? Why must God make things so hard for us? If that's the way you've been dealing with church, I'm afraid you've gotten your picture of church from the wrong space. Yeah, church is not mission impossible. Church is 
What a pleasure, mission possible. I think part of the challenge or part of the discrepancy, the tension comes in when we, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, when we kind of slip and then we think, okay, this is my last, I don't think I'll be able to make this. Uh, and, and then we wonder, is there grace? Should we or shouldn't we? Is God going to get me through or am I up to my, my own resources here? Oh, Lord, help. Give me grace. I think we, we, we're tapping into the wrong imagery. <laughs> Church is not a hotel. Church is not an office block. Church is not this edifice that is difficult for people to get a hold of or get into. Or, you know, it, it's, you, you really, really, really have to want to. Um, sometimes church sucks. And sometimes <laughs> you feel, oh, well... <laughs> And church is, not, church is not a space for elites. Church is not a space for the, the brave to be able to get into what... And it's, church is not supposed to be like that. Church is actually... It's a home. You don't need to go through all of this. You just need to walk into your own... Like it's your own home. It's your father's house. It's family. It's not that difficult. Shouldn't be. If you're finding it difficult, you probably have the wrong picture of what church is all about. You see, Stefan, yeah, <laughs> maybe we should leave Tom to cruise on his own. Yeah. Let him take the plunge. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was supposed to be standing at that screen there so that they could get whatever it was online. But okay. Yeah, you see all... The, yeah, you want to give it... Yeah, never mind. The name Boo Boo kind of... Yeah. Mm. You see, if you, if you want to see the difference between church and a hotel, it's very easy. Um, in a hotel... Each one of them has a primary purpose, and each one of them has a primary process, and each one of them has a preferred outcome. If you look at a hotel, I suppose the primary purpose is, what is it supposed to be? Hospitality? Yeah. Um, it's, you know, guest-focused, we pander to your preferences. That's what hotels do. The preferred outcome, of course, for the hotel owner, it's financial gain through services rendered. So you pay me and I will serve you. Uh, we'll, we have a range of products to be consumed. That's, you know, you, as long as you pay me, you can have them. Uh, what's the... <laughs> the primary purpose of a hotel, I suppose, is relaxation, leisure. The place where you can actually step away from responsibility. A home, unfortunately, is not like that. Home is a little different. You see, the primary purpose of a home is to create space for people to grow. And the primary process through which people grow is taking responsibility. If you do not take responsibility, you probably will not grow. Fortunately, babies come into this world and something kicks in after a while. I want to. I will. Yes, let me. And then parents have to clean up because kids have grabbed the spoon or the dish or the whatever. And there's a lack of remorse all over the place. So kids have that in them. So they want to engage. Sometimes they want to engage for their own benefit. That's fine. They'll grow out of that, hopefully, <laughs> into taking responsibility not just for themselves, but for what's around them and for other people. The primary process to grow in capacity is that you take responsibility. The preferred outcome, of course, is maturity. That's what a home, a house is supposed to enable for people to grow to a place of maturity so that they can engage, they can recognize what has value, choose to engage with what has value. And of course, Take responsibility to experience as well as express love in and beyond the home. The local church, of course, is his house. It's his home. This is where he finds himself present. 
Ah, oh, perfect. Timing. Great stuff. In a few moments' time, hopefully, we will have lights in the other spaces. But the church is his house. Ephesians 2 verse 20, talks, Paul tells, tells us that together we are his house, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, and the cornerstone is Jesus Christ himself. We're his family. Family, of course, will host guests. But a home is not designed only for guests. In fact, a home is designed for another purpose, for a family to grow and to develop in. Uh, yes, hospitality is a value, but it's not an industry. It's, we approach hospitality from a totally different space. We raise a family. We don't just host guests in a house. It's the place where we raise family. Things like discipline, things like responsibility are part of that whole process. How do you enter into his family? By climbing up the wall? Does church drive you up the wall like Tom? No. Climbing, no, we don't have to climb, go through all the hoops. How, how does anybody become part of a family? Right. You get born into it. You come into it as a baby and people embrace you and they help you to grow. Being born into the family of God is very easy. In fact, he's given you the choice whether you want to be part of his family or not. Most times, yeah, and, and I hear these, these atheists and agnostics who are railing against God, I didn't ask to be born. Yes, you're right. <laughs> you didn't ask to be born, but now here you are. Now you need to deal with life. And I suppose kids can feel like that. I didn't want to be born into this family. I kind of felt like that in primary school. <laughs> I didn't want to be part of this family. <laughs> um, you, know, when, you know, somebody said when teenagers at home... Teenagers have three primary problems. You know, home sucks. Dad, dad is dwarf. Ma's ugly. This family, ah, teens. If, for, if your teens are not there, you are blessed. God has given you much grace. But most kids don't like the family they're born into. So God gives us a choice. You can check his family out and you can decide, do you want to be part of this family or don't you? If you do, John 1.12 says, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Those who believe on his name. So if you're busy checking family out, I want to invite you into his family. If you've never made that choice, if you've never made the decision, I want to be part of God's family. In our prayer lounge at the end of this service, we would love to pray with you and solidify that decision so that you can become part of the family of God. You can step into the intentional process that he has in mind within the local church to take you to a place of maturity in life. We grow by taking responsibility. Of course, responsibility, the two components of responsibility is ability and response. So let's start with the ability first. Sorry, Stefan. Uh, the ability, and Philippians 2, 12, 13 talks about his, him being at work in me, creating in me the desire as well as giving me the ability or the capacity to do what pleases him. So God has already taken the initiative. He has begun to stir in me the desire and he has placed within me the ability, the capacity to do what pleases him. All he's asking for is that I respond to his ability. That's what responsibility in the family of God is all about. Maybe in your family you have defined responsibilities in terms of space, process, etc., finances, whatever it may be, your responsibilities. But in the kingdom of God, in the family of God, it's his ability that is the initiative. And you respond to his ability. I respond, and Galatians 6, 4 and 5, I love the way the message phrases this. He says, make a careful exploration of who you are and the work that you've been given. Then sink yourself into that. Don't be impressed with yourself. No. And don't compare yourself with others. 
Each of you must take responsibility for doing the creative best you can with your own life. When you take responsibility, when you respond to his ability, it takes you to a place of wanting to engage beyond yourself. Children, their lives are wrapped up in the now and in the me. But as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, when I was a child, I thought like a child, I spoke like a child, I behaved like a child, everything is about me. He says, but when I became a man, I want you to hear the phrase he uses here, I put away childish things. He doesn't say, I I outgrew selfishness. I outgrew self-centeredness. No, it's a choice that you make to put away childish things and step into the responsibility of maturity. It's a decision that you make. It's a process that you embrace. You respond to his ability. Another metaphor that is used for the church, the household of Christ, um, obviously the purpose of being part of the church, he uses, Paul uses the metaphor of the body. He calls us the body of Christ and every one of us individually being members of his body, different functions, different placing, etc., etc. But the purpose of us engaging and, and growing in the body of Christ is to take us to maturity. Ephesians 4.13 in the message, I just love the way Eugene Peterson has phrased this. When he talks about maturity, he talks about fully mature adults Fully developed within and without, fully alive like Christ. So if you want a definition of what it means to be a mature believer, take those three phrases. Am I a fully mature adult in the spirit? Am I embracing responsibility? Am I engaging for the benefit of others? That's what adults do. Fully mature adults, fully developed within and without. My spirit, my heart, my mind, my internal reality. Am I fully grown and am I expressing that in practical and mature ways? Fully alive like Christ. That's, that's the basic definition of spiritual maturity. Being his body, of course, every one of us has a contribution to make. Now, I know that some of you may feel I'm the floating rib in this body. Uh, Please don't pin me down to any responsibility or process. I'm a floating rib. You know what happened to Adam's floating rib, don't you? It got removed. And God did something else with it. So if you're the floating rib, you might not find yourself anchored in this body and you might find God doing something else somewhere else. I know God always has better plans. I mean, from a floating rib to a fully formed woman, that's like genius. I would never have thought that would, would be possible. So maybe there's glory in your being a floating rib, but I don't think a floating rib is what God wants in his body. I think he wants us all to be connected. Maybe you feel, okay, because you have the gift of criticism, you must be the gallbladder in this body. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, I've, I've read through the, the list of the gifts of the Spirit, and I don't see criticism in any one of them. Um, I've also looked through the five love languages, and I don't see criticism in any one of them, despite what uh, Jeff Allen may say. But we all have a contribution to make. We all need to be connected in some other way. In Ephesians 4, 16 in the Amplified, we read, From him, the whole body, the church in all its various parts, joined and knitted firmly together by what every joint supplies. Young people, can I just read this again? By what every joint supplies. Not by every joint that we supply. When each part is working properly... It causes the body to grow and mature, building itself up in unselfish love. I want you to know, when we connect, the dynamic, the energy of one body part connecting with another, something of his empowering strength takes place at that point of connection. Hebrews 4 verse 12 reminds me that the word of God is powerful. It's sharp. It's, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It also pierces into, he mentions, <laughs> the joints 
and marrow of the body. The body of Christ is empowered at the place of connection by the word of God going into that space. When his word is present, when we connect, something powerful becomes possible. And then in, uh, as deep as the joints and marrow may be, also on the surface, Ephesians 5.26, Paul is telling us that he is taking his word and he's washing us with the water of his word, removing every blemish and wrinkle. Now we know what a blemish is. Hey, it's something that's been kind of put on us from the outside. It's not something inherent. It's something that's angeplak. It's a blemish, and sometimes, you know, those spots, you, you, can, you can wash them off. Um, his word washes us when the world throws stuff at us, and the blemishes that stick get washed off by the water of his word. But also, every wrinkle gets washed out with his word. A wrinkle is there because the skin underneath the wrinkle has kind of deteriorated in quality. So what God does When he washes us with the word, he allows his word to go below the surface and restore the life. We sang that this morning. Things that we thought were dead are breathing with life instead. So many of the things that we sang this morning are images for the way God deals with us as his body. There's a contribution to be made. There's a connection to be made. We engage with with each other from a place of compassion, I engage for your benefit. Ephesians 3.17 talks about being rooted, grounded in love. Uh, and of course, our attitude is like Christ. I just was so, so shocked the other day. I, you know, you kind of get those, you're reading your daily Bible, reading and kind of stuff, and you get to places and you know you've read this before, and then suddenly something jumps out and grabs you. You, you know those kind of experiences. Reading Philippians 2 and... Uh, Reading in in the New King James Version, and here in verse 7, it says that he made himself of no reputation. And suddenly the thought strikes me, why am I so concerned with what people think of me? Why is my reputation so important to me? When he, who had every right to be concerned about his reputation, made himself of no reputation. What am I protecting Am I protecting something that he was quite willing to release? What am I valuing that he is not? And then the other question, what have I failed to attach value to that for him is extremely important? Humility, engaging with one another. Okay, now in the next few weeks, we're going to take this conversation further. But let me just, you know, give you a start I love the story that one of our colleagues many years ago used to tell about this Otani in the train. And she brought her lunch with her, and it's a nice big round red apple. And a couple of people around there, and it's lunchtime, so she takes the apple out. And she's looking at this apple, and the guys are noticing she has no teeth. This is going to kind of be awkward. And then she looks around, and she picks a a young girl. She says, Yiffy. Start them for my ears, I believe. <laughs> Just... <laughs> We're going to go into a conversation in a couple of weeks, in the next few weeks, about the role of church in community. So <laughs> I can't wait for you to start. <laughs> I'm going to take the first bite this morning. <laughs> okay. Why would God want to build his house and raise his family in this community? I kind of look around the, t- the city of Pretoria where I've spent a lot of my life and I kind of know, you know, there are some areas that I would probably not want to buy a house in. There are some areas where I feel I would not want to raise my kids in that area. And then something of, you know, I, I feel compassion for people who have no choice but who find themselves in certain areas and they have to raise a family in that environment, not by choice, but just by circumstance. And then I kind of wonder, God in heaven, he has all the choice in the world. He can choose wherever he wants to build his house and raise his family. And he chooses to do it in this world 
where things are so dear my God, where stuff goes so wrong so easily, he chooses to build his house and raise his family there. Why? What does he have in mind? Is he not concerned that his children are going to be in danger? Well, evidently, as far as he's concerned, there's no danger. Because, as Jesus says, all authority has been given to me. That's him. Jesus has all authority. It's either utter arrogance or it's simple truth. And if you're going to accept the simple truth that he has all authority, a lot of other things kind of click into place. And things like fear, anxiety, all of that kind of stuff kind of comes into perspective of him being the Lord of all. And if he's Lord of my life, then he gets to choose how he deals with what happens to me. That's his responsibility as my father. I'm his son. I live under his leadership. I think God wants to establish something of a reference in a community of what family should look like. In John 1.14, we have the incarnation word. Word becoming flesh, dwelling among us. And it says, we beheld his glory. What The word glory, obviously the Greek word opinion, God's conviction about who man is, is revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. This is what it means to be a son of God, member of his household. This is the reference. His glory, his opinion over us, full of grace and truth. The grace, Jesus comes to reveal to us that we have a father who is not ticking the boxes and making sure we measure up. We have a father who couldn't care less about our mistakes because he has the ability to take everything that goes wrong and use it in some way to bring about that which is good and that which is right. This is the father that we have. We are his children. Full of grace. A father who's not holding our sins against us. Truth. Telling us the truth about who God is as well as telling you the truth about who you are as a child, a son, a daughter of God. We, once again, a great line from the movies. You are more than what you have become. That's the truth that he wants you to grasp. So that... I, I don't know if you've realized this, but the incarnation, it leaves me uncomfortable with the way I live life. Let's take the incarnation to its logical conclusion. The word becomes flesh, takes on a human body. Why? Oh, to die for our sins. Great, why raise that body then from the dead? It had already served its purpose. Oh, there must be another reason then behind the word becoming flesh. Yes, there is. You see, the word became flesh. The eternal word takes on time, space, matter, limitations. Why? So that this body not only can be raised from the dead, but can be returned or restored to its original place. This human body, the body of Jesus Christ, is now seated in heavenly places. All of creation is being governed by a human being. God in the flesh is ruling all of creation. He's telling us, I have a space for you. You belong here. He says in John 14, so that where I am, there you may be also. And Paul picks up on that in Ephesians when he says, we have been seated together with Christ in heavenly places. This is the place from which I engage Everyday life. 
Sometimes on a Sunday, I walk in and I am confronted with the realization that there have been times this week that I actually forgot that I'm supposed to be viewing life and dealing with life from that perspective. I've allowed Hollywood News 24, wherever the, the whatever political party or commentary is being, I've allowed that to become my reference. And I've responded to that instead of engaging with that from knowing I am seated with him in heavenly places. There's nothing that he cannot put right. So let's land with uh, Ephesians 1.23. The church, you see, is Christ's body in which he speaks and acts and by which he fills everything with his presence. This is where God is going. This is why God decided to build a house and raise his family in this community. As Habakkuk says in verse two, chapter 2, verse 14, so that the knowledge of the glory of God can fill this earth but that conversation we'll pick up later on so where are we going to take this this morning maybe and I think Paul preempted something of the power of prayer when we connect together and would you object if I pushed you even further into your discomfort this morning by inviting you to pray with someone and I'm not necessarily going to chase you and force you to go to somebody that you don't know. <laughs> I'm going to invite you to be comfortable about this and pick on somebody that you do know, if that's going to be more comfortable for you. And the connection thing is where I want to go this morning. The Word of God is powerful. When we connect with each other and we speak His Word into each other's lives, something powerful is activated in that life through this connection. You may have a word in your spirit for someone this morning. If you want to go and find them and pray with them and speak that word into their lives, that's awesome. Maybe you're sitting here this morning and you say, yeah, but I don't have a word from God for anyone. That's fine. Whoever turns to you and wants to engage with you, maybe share with them just one thing that you appreciate and that you value or that you enjoy about being part of his family. Maybe you're part of this local church, part of his family. That's cool. If there's something here that you like and enjoy, tell them about it. Um, but let's not do the gallbladder thing. That's, you know, the gift of criticism. <laughs> let's, let's keep that for, you know, the prayer cards. Pray for me. I'm seeing this and that and the other is wrong. We'll pray for you. Yeah, we'll, yeah, yeah, we'll do that. We'll do that. But not, not here, not now. Strangely enough, they tell me a dove, which is the symbol of the Holy Spirit, is the one bird or animal that does not have a gallbladder. I'm kind of curious that the dove, Holy Spirit, we being His home, filled with His Spirit, maybe the gift of criticism is not part of His intention for us as a family. Let's stand then. Let's move to each other. Let's take two or three minutes. Let's not pray all the verses. Let's pray short. Let's engage with each other. Yeah, Psalm 117, three sentences. Psalm 119, 175 verses. That's next week. This week, Psalm 117. Thank you.